Good afternoon. Welcome to the 8th Vulnerable Patient Symposium. It's been a long journey since the first VP meeting uh, here in Orlando, 2001, March 2001, uh, where we had our first dinner event with a very small number of uh, colleagues uh, who were focused on vulnerable plaque. Jim Muller remembers that because he opened the me meeting. Erling Fall followed with uh, his presentation of uh, misnomer vulnerable plaque and brought uh, two uh, bottles of uh, candies and the other one was supposed to be toxic and argued how could vulnerable plaque, which one is vulnerable plaque and how could we define vulnerable plaque. This was a fascinating meeting in the eve of uh, March, I don't even remember the day, but March 2001. We have come a long way since then. The first VP meeting was about finding vulnerable plaque with temperature, with near infrared spectroscopy signature, with ultrasound and else. Ever since we have held, thanks to uh, pioneers and leaders who lend their support and their uh, uh, guidance to this effort, a grassroots effort. We've had eight symposia. Through this eight symposia, we have evolved the concept of vulnerable plaque to where we are vulnerable patient, where multiple components of vulnerability to contribute to what we are focusing on as heart attack, acute coronary syndrome, and sudden cardiac death. I want to be very brief here that this journey of four years of brain uh, storming and uh, intellectual development uh, has been very productive and promising. The very last meeting, which was not counted in this eight, was a focus group meeting last year, August, in Santa Monica, California, with a group of uh, uh, very thought leaders in the field who had the time to participate in this focus group. And our goal was to come up with a guideline based on what we have learned to approach the concept of screening. And we all know we can't do screening for vulnerable plaque in cat lab for everybody. It was so obvious. And the, the technique must have been outside of hospital uh, cat lab and invasive procedures. So this is a very brief summary of what we discussed there. In the United States every year, there are one, about 1 1.3 to 1 1.4 million heart attacks. Half of it, according to American Heart Association, the numbers are not written on the stone, uh, 650,000 or more are from asymptomatic, previously unknown, unknown coronary heart disease population. These are apparently healthy uh, people, just like you and I, hopefully. The bottom of this pyramid, if you focus on uh, age group 45 and above, which is the subject of this uh, screening guideline, and um, female 55 and above, you end up having 70, about 72 million Americans. Uh, we know about 12 million Americans have actual coronary disease. We took those out, assuming they were all uh, 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 subpopulation of this age group. You end up 65 million people, asymptomatic, healthy, non-coronary heart disease population. Now we are against a pyramid with 65 million at the bottom of the pyramid and 650,000 at the top of the pyramid. How do we screen? How do we go about finding the vulnerable patient? This is the topic of today. I would like to uh, summarize uh, what we have discussed in a very simplified slide that Dr. P.K. Shaw uh, put together. The committee, the group that uh, has gone through several uh, iterations of this thought, uh, believe that we do need to be cost conscious and to be con conscious, we recognize the very low risk group, which is defined based on cholesterol less 20 or 80, heart disease, no diabetes, smoking, uh, as 
very low risk group. Unfortunately, this population in the United States is less than 10% and some uh, claim less than 3% if you uh, consider all of the above. You are above uh, the first step of shape, which is test for as atherosclerosis. I don't want to go into detail. Based on those, you follow a guideline. What is unique about uh, shape in this guideline? Dr. Falk will go to detail, but in one line is we are trying to learn from what has been learned in the cancer arena. In the cancer arena, which is now sucking more budget from national uh, reimbursed budget than cardiovascular, you have screening for disease, not for risk factors. You are not screening for uh, uh, risk factors of cervical cancer. You're screening for presence of disease in cervical cancer. You're not screening for risk factor of breast cancer or uh, tumor in breast. You're screening for a mass in breast. We need to screen for subclinical coronary disease before it becomes clinical. That is the unique part of uh, shape, and we will go into uh, details as Erling presents. I'd like to stop here and invite our first speaker who uh, really inspired all of these efforts, the vulnerable plaque field. Dr. Fuster actually four years ago got the first vulnerable plaque award, but Dr. Fuster has not been the main center of our uh, brainstorming recently. We invited him uh, late. He, he has been watching me and uh, uh, has had his hand on my back for the past two years, uh, but just the past week or so had, had a chance to go through these uh, thoughts and we invited his comments and we very much appreciate his time sharing with us his thoughts. Thank you very much, Dr. First. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mort, for uh, giving me a, another opportunity to express free thoughts. <laughs> I think one of the interesting things about these meetings is that, uh, in a way, is a meeting where you don't have constraints of a uh, of ideas and so forth, and I, uh, I have certainly to congratulate you by uh, being, being innovative, which is what this field needs today. I'm going to go quickly into a way of thinking. Uh, I, I wouldn't put this any further than saying that uh, cardiovascular disease is an epidemic. The difference between cancer and cardiovascular disease is that cancer either you have it or you don't. Atherosclerotic disease, everybody has it. And the question is the degree, and that's what makes things difficult. You know, when you talk about risk factors, you have to see in that context, cancer is there or is not. And I think uh, it, this is actually uh, the way I like to talk first. First of all, there is uh, epidemiology and change. Let me just do. Uh, first question is epidemiology and change in emphasis. This is the reality. Uh, the reality is uh, cardiovascular disease, coronary disease, 1990, 2020. This is non-Western countries. These are Western countries. Life has been prolonged six years in three decades, four of them related to better treatments of myocardial infarction. The problem is, as life is being prolonged, we are not preventing the disease, which is going up at a tremendous speed. And this is something that is really alarming. And the question is why this is happening. I will say to you that in the center of all of this is actually the metabolic syndrome. When you start looking at what is happening, and this is an example, 1990, 2000, this is the same methodology. More than 20% of a given population who is obese in 1990, look in 2000, the country is getting purple. Now, if you now look at diabetes, more than 6% of a region being diabetics, you see what the change is in just 10 years. And again, it's the same methodology. And this is absolutely alarming to the point that the World Health Organization actually has a, a meeting in about three weeks, which I will be there, because this is absolutely alarming. It's not just in the United States. It's actually all over the world. Now, the problem is starts in children. 
And that's what I want to emphasize. Although this organization is looking at people over age of 45, I like to make uh, some kind of a statement, few statements today that if we don't go earlier, we are going to miss the boat here. These are children by the Enhanced study, which you, many of you know, where low HDL in, in children between 12 and 19 years in this country being low in 45%, hypertriglyceridemia in 30% being high, almost diabetes, hyperglycemia, 5%, central obesity in this country, 22% of children, and now you have hypertension. Now, the figures, if you go back 15 years ago, were much, much lower. So the problem that we are facing right now is an epidemic that really begins in childhood. And we cannot lose track of that because that's the root of the problem. So having said that, let me now evolve into at least my way of thinking on this very significant issue. This, to me, explains how we are moving from target to target in the last five years. And I'd like to make a few points. First, we move from the high-risk plaque, let's call vulnerable plaque, to the high-risk symptomatic patient, because that's really how all began to the, the, these discussions began. And I'd like to say to you that uh, this is a plaque that is very troublesome, but let me make one point. The concept of vulnerable plaque or high-risk plaque is an autopsy concept. And let's be clear, a patient dies, you do an autopsy, Erling Falk, and says, that plaque has a clot, there is a vulnerable plaque here, I see fat. If you go prospectively with imaging, it's a completely different story, because you see many plaques that you would call the same. And that's very important that we know historically. This began from autopsy, but it's not when you go prospectively, it's much more complex. And therefore, here we have the patient who presents with acute coronary syndromes, chronic atherothrombotic disease, or coronary artery disease equivalent, <coughs> diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, carotid disease. And what I want to present to you today is that we have to be very simple, catch the problem, and see what can we do about it. And let me begin by saying that all the imaging technologies, in my own view, I think thus far are failing. In, the, in, a, in, in really capturing the vulnerable plaque. And the question is why they are failing. And I'd just like to make three comments. First, is a systemic disease. Second, the plaques are very abundant, those that may lead to trouble. It's not an autopsy, it's an in vivo. And third, not everything is a high risk plaque. The blood may be hypercoagulable, adding variables that make a patient to develop a thrombus that is not just a single plug with fat that is going to explode. There are many systemic disease and the, and the mechanism of a blood clot is not necessarily plaque rupture in about 30 to 40% of patients. Now, I'd like to make a comment about each item. The first, this is a systemic disease and to me it's very impressive when you do brachial endothelial vasoconstrictive studies or vasodilating studies and, and then you find out that in patients with coronary artery disease who present many of them with with myocardial infarction you might predict if they do well on the brachial vasodilation they do very well clinically and as you have constriction of the vessels in the brachial arteries then you might you have significant more events the point I'm trying to make here is a systemic disease, so there are many markers that are telling us that it's troublesome. And, and a simple marker is actually just looking at vasodilation, vasoconstriction in the brachial artery. It's a systemic disease. The second is this angioscopic study, I like it, from Japan, you probably know of it, but I will summarize by saying that if you have a patient with an acute myocardial infarction and you open the artery and then you go with your angioscope, the chances is in that artery you are going to see one or two more lesions that look very similar to the lesion that led to the heart attack. And if you now go to the other two arteries, you find one or two more. What I'm really saying to you, we are dealing with the tip of an iceberg, and within the coronary system there are a number of these plaques. Final comment is just to be sure that that, that we understand how things change rapidly. About 
maybe three, four years ago, we used to say the carotid plaques that lead to a cerebrovascular event are very stenotic, very fibrotic. And therefore, we cannot explain this by plaque rupture. Let's, let me make the long story short. We were wrong. In fact, the issue is quite different. The plaques in the carotid arteries are 80%, but they have a lot of fat. The question is why in the coronary arteries the fat is in a plaque that is growing eccentrically, and in the, in the carotid arteries the fat is in a plaque that grows concentrically. And now we begin to have some data on this, and that this has to do with remodeling. The coronary arteries, as the plaque grows, the artery grows eccentrically. The carotid does not. So as the plaque grows, grows concentrically, and you can have an 80% lesion with the fat and the rupture, and not necessarily is the 80% lesion in a coronary that tends to be fibrotic. I'm just presenting this to you because this all comes through the imaging technologies that are really telling us many things that maybe before we had wrong concepts. And this is just uh, uh, an example that what leads to a blood clot is different from region to region, but we were wrong in the way we interpret the carotid arteries. In fact, there is the, a lot of similarity with the, with the coronary arteries. So we have to say from the high-risk plaque, we went to the high-risk symptomatic patient, and that we found that patient with many plaques, many mechanisms of leading to a blood clot, so we have to move on and say, I'm not getting anywhere. The next step is you move from the high-risk asymptomatic patient to the, inter to the intermediate and low-risk patient. And I, I like to point out, because this is what your document is about. Your document has five layers here, not three. Doesn't matter. But basically, we are talking about the same thing, and that is we have to get away from the very top and begin to look in the bottom if there is something that we can be able to predict and maybe move on from the point of view of prevention or therapies. Having said that, I'm now going into what I consider is real business, and that is to go to all of these layers and to present to you what can be innovative that we may have an impact in the field in the next five to 10 years. And this is basically my discussion. And I will start actually from the top of the pyramid. I like to start from the high risk symptomatic patient, and then I will move to the high risk asymptomatic patient, intermediate risk, low risk, and I will make a comment about your organization here. So let me begin to go to the high risk symptomatic patient. And the issue is the following. We are on the top, and now we are trying to do something about it. Myocardial infarction, number one. The time for the patient from chest pain to go to the hospital and being reperfused in this country is an average of three hours. Maybe in 10 years will be half of it, and there are ways to, the, the prediction is probably correct. What I like to make a point today, constantly I will make it, that if we are not simple, we will not prevent this disease. And simplicity to me is the name of the game. Complexity, you don't lead anywhere. Marketing is always simple. You talk to marketing people and they will tell you, at the moment you make a drawing that is complex, forget it, nobody will follow it. Based on this, let me predict what is going to happen in the ambulance in a few years from now, and as the patient develops a myocardial infarction. And this is, again, is a prediction, and the data is evolving. We are, today, you are giving aspirin, isn't it? At the moment, the patient has chest pain. This is a drug that is better than aspirin. It's a thromboxane blocker, specifically, which permits prostacycline to work. Aspirin blocks prostacycline. You need a 40 milligram dose. Thromboxane receptor blockers are coming very rapidly. And those of you who are in the field, you probably are grasping this in the last year or so. And I don't have much more to say. Clopidogrel is a, is a tough drug because it works through an intermediary. It goes into the receptor of ADP, and then an intermediary do the job, and you do not dominate the drug. But there are new clopidogrel drugs, which we will talk about this tomorrow, which are very direct. You can dominate, and maybe as effective as clopidogrel, but at least you can dominate the drug much better. You go to the hospital, and then you start injecting heparin. I will tell you that the data evolving with oral factor 10A inhibitor is as good or better than subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin or intravenous um, 
heparin and fractionated heparin. Then you have the statin. So you have a patient in the ambulance has had acute coronary syndrome, has been diagnosed through whatever EKG at a distance, you give a single pill. And this single pill, or polypill, contains all the ingredients. Now, the patient's at a high risk. Desti depression is all over. The question is, well, needs 2B3A. I, I like to make a comment about 2B3A. In my view, maybe bias, I believe oral antithrombins will take over 2B3A. It blocks the peritone receptor of thrombin that is very important. It's a drug that you dominate. And I can envision the treatment of a myocardial infarction with a pill, not with, no, not with intravenous stuff or drugs, absolutely in the ambulance. I have to tell you, you might prevent by doing that at least 25 to 50% of the deaths that happen with myocardial infarction, which is in the first three hours. And I'm just presenting this to you, what simplicity means. Simplicity means you can do anything you want once the patient's in the hospital. You have to go ahead and do something that's very simple. And this is evolving very rapidly, which is oral therapy, and I believe will be in a single pill. This is my, uh, at least my view of seeing that problem. There is a second problem. Now the patient has chronic coronary artery disease or has coronary artery disease equivalent. The same thing. Patients, you know, after two years of a myocardial infarction, only 15% are doing what they are supposed to do, taking the pills, taking care of their risk factors. Again, I think this is going to evolve on a completely different single pill. It's the single pill that you give for chronic disease, which will address the issue of compliance. And I'm just presenting, sure, somebody saying, well, the dose of statin, forget, will be three pills with different doses of statins. All these things are, are small things. The important is the concept. We have to move into simplicity. And this applies to the patients who are now I'm discussing are the high risk patients. So that's basically my point of view. At the moment that we all struggle about how we identify the patient, I'm just thinking, well, once it's identified, let's do something that can work very rapidly. Now I'm going to move into actually the patient who never had any symptom or any symptomatology, and I divide not in five layers like you do, it's divided in three, but anyway. And here's what it comes, this term which I like very much is the burden of atherosclerotic disease because bad is very bad. So that it just fits, again, for simplicity. Let me, let me begin here by talking about this group. This is a high risk asymptomatic, A means a symptomatic patient that maybe has subclinical disease. And you know what you do these days. You go to Framingham and you look at all the risk factor profile and you end up with a very high score which puts the patient in a 10 year deal which is of a significant more than 20% events at 10 years once you do the score. I'm not going into the details of this. We, we have been interested in imaging for some time. My interest in imaging has more to do, frankly, in understanding disease that they're just giving us NAP diagnosis right away. So I'm just, so you have to understand where I'm coming from. I'm not going to start giving you this, the CT is better than MR to see the 90% lesion. Actually, that's not my talk. I'm just more interested in see how we get into the mechanisms that we can make some difference into the patient. Okay, this is technology that I think that he will, will discuss this, which is really you measure the atherosclerotic burden, in this case is into the aorta, and you present this in a square millimeters. And this is a study with uh, actually 42 patients with were in Framingham, with different Framingham scores at 10 years. But the bottom line was the following, and I, here is where I am with you. What happened here is when all the patients were looked at, some had coronary disease, some not, it didn't make a difference into the Framingham score. You couldn't predict who had coronary disease, who didn't. However, when you look at the score of the MRI, it was highly predictable. Pointing out what you said before, if you see the disease directly, in this case is in the aorta, you can predict much better this coronary artery disease or not than if you go to a Framingham score. So in a way, this is a reality that is to look directly at the, at the disease. There are many other ways to assess this indirectly, and, and I know you are very high on this, which is the carotid, uh, uh, the carotid intimal medial thickening, and certainly there are studies done that show that there is some merit on that in terms of showing 
incidence of coronary events, progression or regression of disease, and I don't want to go into the details of the arbitrary study, how niacin in non-diabetic, non-metabolic syndrome, and when uh, uh, attached to a statin, can actually decrease that particular parameter and perhaps has implications in coronary disease. So there are other ways to go indirectly. What I presented to you a minute ago, which is to look at the burden of disease, is going to be applied in a study we are starting actually in a few days, a freedom trial of diabetic patients with multivessel disease surgery versus stenting and looting stents. But what we are going to do actually is bad. And that is how the disease progresses in the diabetic versus the non-diabetic patient. And if we treat the patients aggressively, risk factors, not whether you do stenting or surgery, this is a site. Maybe we will convert the diabetic patient into a non-diabetic patient, but we have the technology to really look at this, and that is to follow the disease directly and to see how you manage it. And I think that's what is appealing of this. So I'd like just to mention that certainly MR technology, by looking in the way I discussed, can be certainly diagnostic of disease, of systemic disease, and can have implications in the coronary arteries. But again, the issue is not only diagnosis. What about treatment? And here comes the second item I want to talk about for a moment. And that is, the studies done in the carotid arteries, uh, what was done in 2005 is probably much better than what we did in 1999, which is to do MRI of the carotid arteries and to really characterize the disease with magnetic resonance imaging. Our study was after the specimens were taken out by endarterectomy, and there is no difference the way you see the carotid arteries in vivo, and as you can see after you take the specimen with endarterectomy. But certainly points out the importance of what we began to work with Sahi in, uh, uh, in, in uh, four years ago, which is to begin to look at plaques in the coronary arteries in terms of identifying different types of tissue. And this is tough, but it will come. I'd like just to point this to you because now that you can characterize the tissue, at least in the main arteries with MRI, you are in a fantastic platform to begin to apply drugs. And you know, we began, as you probably know, by looking at carotids and aortas with, the, with some fat here in black, and we began to give simvastatin 20 versus 80 milligrams in 50 patients. And what we saw in that study, and this has been reproduced by the group at Hopkins with transesophageal MRI, is that after six to 12 months of giving a statin, the arteries shrink and the fat goes away. And the mechanism is quite fascinating. It seems the fat goes away to the back door through the vasa basorum. They probably have a role to take the fat out. And when you lower LDL by a gradient of concentration, it goes away. But that's basically what we found. What is interesting in that study is that if the LDL got below 100, the regression of the disease was much more significant than if the LDL was more than 100. And this really goes along with what was found in the PRUVIT TIMI-22 and reversal trial when a torvastatin that lower LDL much more than pravastatin was much more successful in the regression and stabilization of the, of the disease by ultravascular ultrasound or by um, or clinically. And this is the second e example with Sahi was, was, that was published uh, with the Japanese group about oh, maybe two weeks ago. And this is the work done with atorvastatin rather than simvastatin. And it's fascinating. It really takes into account the technology I am, I am mentioning to you, but I'd like to show you the power of this technology. Here's a situation where you give atorvastatin 5 milligrams or atorvastatin 20 milligrams. And more is a decrease of LDL, more significantly is the decrease of atherosclerotic disease burden over a 12-month period. So you have visually, you see exactly what goes on, and you can correlate. And that, I think this is beautiful. In other words, you're really dealing now with what goes on in the vessel wall. This was much better in the thoracic aorta than in the abdominal aorta. And I have some constraints of time, so I prefer to move on rather than giving examples. But it's just to point out to you that we are now closer to making an impact by understanding better how this disease develops and what can make the disease to regress that you can visually see directly. 
These are all the studies we have done with HDL. In summarizing the slide are five studies. When you enhance HDL in an animal model, either you increase it or you make it more active, there is regression of the atherosclerotic process, which goes much faster than when you give statins. And the point is, the fat in the macrophage, which is what HDL takes care of, goes out very rapidly. And the regression of the disease may take five to six weeks just with HDL racing, compared with a statin, that it takes about a year to begin to see the difference. And in a statin is extracellular fat. I only want to point out this to you because now, with these technologies I am showing to you, we are going to use a molecule which has been very successful in the animal model and has, is a PPAR which has three components. One that enhances HDL, another is anti-inflammatory component, and the other one is anti-diabetic. And I just want to point out this to you, that this is going to be used again in this study in which this technology that I'm showing is going to be, now we are going to be addressing not only the LDL component, extracellular component, but the macrophage component of fat, which PPAR, and, and I think enhancing HDL. And all of this will be addressed by imaging technology. Now, I only wanted to present this aspect to you, and that is this technology not only tells you whether there is disease, but what can you do about it? What are the new drugs that we have available? And I presented to you this molecule of PPAR that we will be able to address very rapidly with technology like this. And this leads to the, the last comment on this, which is called, is a patient who is a very highly risky patient, but now we want to look at the disease rather than by density, as I showed to you now with MR, is like you do immunofluorescence. And basically the principle is this. You have fat, statins work here, you have macrophages, you have clots, you have basavasorum. Can you identify these molecules? And begin to use treatments in your patients, this is not animal, but in your patients that may tell you what you are doing. And the concept is simple. It's the concept that you have a molecule you want to identify, LDL, for example, or fibrin and you have an antibody or a peptide, and you have a transporter, and then you, you here you have the iron with the transporter, and you inject this, and the iron identifies if by MRI how many of those molecules are present. And this is data obtained in the rabbit model. Look how nice. This is like immunofluorescence of the aorta where the LDL has been deposited. This is a combination of macrophages and HDL without going into too much detail, also in an animal model, in an artery, which is actually one millimeter. And this is actually the injection of iron particles which go into macrophages, and this is the identification of a one millimeter blood clot in the carotid artery of the rabbit by the same mechanism. This is what we call molecular MR, and you're saying, so what? Now we are going to patients with all of this. And we are going again to the freedom trial. And we are going to address peripheral vascular disease like you do immunofluorescence to see all the components of the plaques. And this is the study. And actually it's going to be done in sequence. All the things I presented to you are going to be injected in sequence and looking at the legs of patients where you can identify these components and begin to use new ways of therapy. This is what we call molecular MR, and it's quite exciting. So what I have done in the high-risk population is, frankly, we have to understand this population better. And we have to see new drugs that affect the disease. And this is what I was really trying to, to convey to you. These are individuals who do not have disease yet, but new technologies will tell us the burden of disease and will allow us to address new treatments, new approaches, and new uh, understanding of the disease by itself. Now, in your, uh, in, in your map, you have calcification and CRP as one of the aspects, particularly calcification in the beginning of the screen. I want to address this briefly in the intermediate risk patient. The high risk, to me, is a research tool, and that's what I wanted to present to you. Burden of disease, better understanding of disease, better treatments, see what we affect with these treatments. We are here on an intermediate risk population at Framingham, 
which means the number of events is about 5 to 20 percent over a 10-year period once you do the Framingham score, which is here. The problem with intermediate risk patient is that you cannot predict whether it's intermediate or not. You have the score, you put it here, you follow the patient for 10 years, and you find that you have been wrong many times. So the intermediate risk patient is very troublesome because many are high risk and many are low risk. It means the risk factor profile is pretty variable. And this is where I think that things like the calcification, the degree of calcification of the coronary arteries adds to the Framingham, is making that particular intermediary risk either mild or severe according to the degree of calcification. I'm just presenting this to you because you have the calcification is zero or no zero, uh, which is fine, it's a way to start, but at least the way I see calcification is there is a different gradient of calcification which really you can attach to Framingham. And the same happens with CRP. If you really look at CRP carefully, is how much CRP is there may make a patient that is moderately in Framingham is intermediate, making it high risk, or a patient that has a very low CRP, making it a very low risk. And this is the way I see these tests, actually, more of adding to the risk factor profile. I like to go and actually finish into what I consider today is our challenge. And our challenge is in the low risk population, whether you like it or not. Because we call today low risk this 40 year old who is doing very well and probably is moving into a high risk very rapidly and we don't have any idea that he's getting there. This is the population we are dealing with, very, very prevalent in this country. It's what we call a low risk population. You do Framingham, and this is the individual, maybe over age of 40, that has one single risk factor. Or maybe under age of 40, has a couple of risk factors. And the question is, you call this low risk, because the incidence of events is about less than 5% in 10 years. To me, the whole epidemic is evolving in this layer. And therefore, it's hard to say we are not interested. Because if you study obesity in the metabolic syndrome, what has evolved in the last 15 years, there is no question comes from the bottom layer up. Therefore, if we don't attack that layer vigorously, I don't think we are going to have a great success in the prevention of the epidemic. That's why I'm emphasizing that aspect. And I have few comments to make. Actually, I have three comments to make. First, this is the layer of the government up there. And that is, if we go to our government and we say, you know, if the population of this country uh, decree or, or stop smoking, we would decrease 50% coronary events. Like in East Finland, the government changed the diet and they dropped cholesterol by 10%, 30% less coronary events at 15 years of follow-up. Diastolic pressure, six, uh, diastolic pressure, a drop of six millimeters of mercury, 42% decrease in a stroke and 16% of CHD. And that to me is the challenge that we have. You mentioned cancer, they are rainbow, they, they, we do mammography and so forth, yes, but you see cancer you have it or you, or, or you don't, but we are dealing here with a progression of disease and the governments are less interested to see something that is very long in the future that is during their tenure. But the realities are that this is the data that can make a difference. So this is number one. This has to be a priority on the health systems of a given country. The second issue I want to mention, which it looks funny, but is not so funny when you think about it, is the so-called polymill. All these are all the studies done recently, which are prospective studies using different types of milk, Mediterranean diet and so forth. And what the studies show when you pull them together that if you eat what is here, including wine, and maybe you might not smell too well because it's garlic, but if you eat this, this is what people used to eat more than 100 years ago. This is not, this is not absolutely unique. But the thing is we are eating differently. You could decrease the incidence of events, by, they say, by 76%, whatever. But the fact of the matter is there is one point here, and that is this is a, a disease that we have acquired in a society of consumption. Therefore, 
we can have all the maps, maps of prevention, but if we don't go from the top, from the government, into changing things, I don't think we will get too far. Things I would do, first, I would penalize restaurants that serve you portions that are double than what should be. And you said, this affects the freedom of people. I will tell you an example. If you go to the, to the road and you don't have green lights and, 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 yellow, and yellow lights and green lights, this affects your freedom? It doesn't. You need that. The problem is we are creating a disease in an incredible way, and we can do any map we can say in prevention, but if this doesn't come from the top and we really change things that are in the culture, I personally think it's not going to go anywhere because we are talking on the bottom layer. And this leads to my final comment on the bottom, which has to do with children. This study has been very criticized, which is an NIH study completely focused on children and particularly on the mothers that are pregnant even before the children are born. And the whole project, which is $2.7 billion, is to really understand what happened to these children and their environment that made them to develop disease in a later stage. I will say to you that that to me is critical. Um, you know, it's funny, but I'm working now with Sesame Street. This is a, a you might know what Sesame Street is, that they hired me as, a, as a, an advisor. And, and I'm working with them. And actually, the project that I'm working is quite fascinating, is to teach the six to nine-year-olds the importance of nutrition and the importance of uh, uh, not using drugs and so forth. But they are not at, the, at that age, they don't use them. But it's the only age that you capture, that you remember. And then when the time comes, you remember what happened in age six to nine. That's what I learned from the psychologists of Sesame Street. And the project is to go to the 15 to 20-year-olds who are the role models of these kids, to teach them, you invigorate these people at that age that is so vulnerable, and then they teach the kids who are their role models into what I'm discussing. This is what I call innovation. And we are starting with three institutions call, uh, in this country, schools, uh, in Venezuela and in Brazil. And the whole issue is to, in the same school, how we can begin to change things, because if we don't go to the bottom, of all these layers, I don't think we will go too far. So these are the comments I wanted to make. I'd like to finish by, I was asked to provide my view of, of the organization and the document that you are describing here. And I will very frankly, will present to you my view. First of all, I personally think that this is innovative. So I, in the, I'm talking here today because of that. I think, I think this is a good organization that tried to do new things. And I think that's great. I would say to you that questions I have, these are no more than comments, is this whole tree feasible? Because if you start with just the screening with imaging, this is going to be pretty tough when you go to a broad population. And if you don't start with the risk factors, uh, again, I'm presenting you questions. There's not, nothing else than that. The second, the second issue is as you move from the top to the bottom, things get very complex. Are you simple enough? I would keep simplicity, and I want to tell you, give the freedom to the doctor to work on the bottom. Don't start saying, measure this, measure that, because it reminds me to uh, that tree that says, uh, non-elective non, um, se oh, surgery in patients with coronary disease. Kim Eagle did a good job, but if you look at the number of boxes are 75, and there's no way that you can get into 75 boxes and at the end say what to do with the patient has to be conceptually. So I would keep the bottom pretty simple and, and for the freedom of the physician. The thing that I miss there is some of what I to portray to you today that we have to really have in mind prevention, management, action. Because if you just stay into identification, you are getting very short. And again, I'm not criticizing because your innovative is just a comment. I was asked to comment on that. The final issue is, Maybe there are too many authors there, polyauthor. Um, you know, I think maybe 22 people contributed very much. Put the 22, I'm not debating that. But, but there are people who read and put the name and they leave. These, these attempts against credibility, I have to tell you, in the, in the world of science. And that is when you have so many people, you really feel, well, you know, I am not sure this is credible. 
and again is a comment and I would say you know, you know how many people contributed to this document and again <coughs> I have to congratulate you because you are trying to do something which is quite innovative and I just present to you these last comments well <coughs> look thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity I presented to you a point of view on a huge issue which is a disease that is actually doubling despite that we go out and says everything is going fine in fact it's not going so fine and that is we are prolonging life but we are not preventing the disease and this is the reality of what is happening today thank you very much thank you very much dr Fuster. and I, uh, while you're here i want to tell you you're very well heard here uh, every single point that you made here comes from years of research and uh, dealing with this issue in practice and we appreciate it very much I wanted also to comment that, uh, unfortunately, we are on the same boat in this regard. The cancer field has been much louder because somebody has cancer, celebrities particularly. They live and they live longer than a heart attack victim, and they are a walking advertiser for their fee. They grab budget for the yeah. research, for care. Yeah. A celebrity with heart attack is dead in 50 or 60, 70 percent of cases, and most of them really are at an age that are not hurt. The second issue that you said you either have cancer or no, is very true. In certain cancer you have a few months or a year. We have come to define vulnerable patient in a way that you, when you have it, you just don't have more time than a year or six months. You're dead after that because a vulnerable patient is not a vulnerable patient in 10 years or 20 years. It's a vulnerable patient because of the a high degree of uh, disease presence and uh, extent of disease is at risk of a very near future. But we need your help to define this further because we all appreciate that the concept is immature to be numerically defined and for practice. So we're using it as a conceptual. But well, we hope we can get to a day that we can define the way, same way the cancer is defined. Yeah, I want to make a comment. You see, uh, what, what is the, what is the your your other shape? shape? Screening for heart attack prevention and education. Education. Program. Okay. We're missing uh, that part. That's exactly the that issue. Is exactly. In fact, if you are asking my opinion, in that word, the E at the end is critical. It's absolutely critical. And everything you are talking to me about is you have to educate people to listen to you. Absolutely. That's missing. Absolutely. Well. We put education on purpose to remind ourselves that that's our duty and we haven't yeah. done it. That is but absolutely true and I appreciate again your comments. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. You. appreciate it. We're moving to the next presentation. We're missing Dr. Uh, P.K. Shaw, who uh, was... Uh, Schedule, thank you. As our second uh, presenter, unfortunately due uh, to a family loss, he had to cancel his flight, and uh, we we're hoping to have him later during this meeting. Uh, we're actually missing several people here. I should credit this. The very first meeting that we held here in Orlando of 2001 uh, was, uh, it was indeed uh, Credit to Dr. James Willerson. He was uh, my former mentor, and Dr. Ward Cassells. Without their help, we couldn't even have the first meeting, second, and and so on. Dr. Willerson wishes success, and he apologized he couldn't make it. Uh, we're going to uh, actual debate now. You've heard a lot about this confident presentation, and we've been through a lot of brainstorming, email brainstorming. If you can just uh, Imagine uh, somewhere around 500 to 1,000, I, I can't even count, emails uh, exchanged between Erling Falk and different members of the task force just in the past three months. This is not an exaggeration. 1,000 emails, we have a record of all of those, and one day we will post them on the website, but we're not ready yet. <laughs> there are a lot of harsh wording in, in those emails. So, so all of us are dead. <laughs> With those emails, yes, if you count them, some of us should be dead by now. But we have the, uh, this is an, an enormous opportunity, intellectual opportunity for people in the field to be able to talk like this and create uh, uh, an abundance of uh, intellectual property for the entire community. Dr. Falk has taken the 
uh, pain of being the center and uh, communicating with uh, a wide range of expertise in the field. And if you have not heard in, uh, if you have not heard Erling Fox, you shouldn't be in this room. But if you are, uh, I should say that, I, in my opinion, he should be credited for really teaching us plaque rupture. He, he really brought this plaque rupture versus the cons, the old traditional concept of plaque narrowing. Erling took a 